Lamanaseach, Shir Mizmur, for the worship leader, a song, a hymn. Shout to God, all the earth, make music to the glory of his name, establish the glory of his praise. Say to God, how fearsome are your works. In the greatness of your strength, your enemies shrink before you. All the earth shall bow before you and make music to you. They will make music to your name. Selah. Come and see the works of God. How fearsome are his dealings with the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. We rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not rise up against him. Selah. O peoples, bless our God. Let the voice of his praise be heard. He has held our souls in life and not let our foot slip for you tested us, O God, you refined us like refined silver. You drew us into the net, you put pressure on us. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into freedom. I will come into your house with burning sacrifices. I will fulfill my vows to you, which my lips uttered, which my mouth spoke when I was in distress. I will offer a burning sacrifice to you of fat cattle. With the sweet smoke of rams, I will prepare bulls and billy goats. Selah. Come and hear and I will tell all who fear God what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, and high praise was under my tongue. If I had looked at evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard. But God did hear, he did attend to the voice of my prayer. Bless God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his love from me. See, I was fascinated when um, by what you say about the, the particularly the Jewish um, uh, interpretations of this psalm, and the, I mean those they obviously the way they kind of read their own history into it. So that you, you quote the, from the Targum about you brought us into Egypt to impose the rule of Bab the Babylonians upon us. Um, the Medes rode over us. The Greeks came over our head. You brought us in among the Romans, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's a lovely kind of freedom that they had, isn't it? In <laughs> Lots of Psalms. It's not just this one where you've got the emphasis on them having been in exile, not just Egypt, which is obviously the imagery here about the, the passing through the river on foot and so on. Makes you think of, of, of their escape from Egypt. But they actually add it to that, the exile in Babylon, and then the persecution, particularly under Greek rule. So it was like three exiles. And the fact the psalm has got three headings, um, a leader, song and psalm, they saw these three headings as indicating three different exiles when that suffered as a... Ah. So, um, right. yeah, and, and then the, um, yes, the psalm actually is interpreted also through Daniel 6 in Jewish tradition, i.e. Daniel and the lion's den and so on. And this, mm -hmm. is, this is actually uh, about... Daniel's a type of all the Jews in, in persecution in the Babylonian exile. So, yes, the exilic, the sense of being in exile is very much a context for the psalm. But that's that's really interesting because I think that's true in, in the Christians, in that the psalm is written at a certain point and refers back. Yeah. Uh, but actually, because the psalm is then chanted for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years afterwards, yeah. it acquires its own future, as it were. It kind of becomes a psalm about things that, hadn't happened when the psalmist wrote, but which fit that pattern. And once you realise that, you see the Christian interpretation is just another level of doing it's another that. layer, absolutely. And it in no way, it in no way excludes or obscures the earlier things. It's it's yeah. a continuation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The and, Christian I mean, the water imagery in baptism, you know, and so it was yes. very much psalm when all the you know new converts were, were beginning to be baptized. And I mean do you there's there is you mentioned that there's a as a really interesting sort of Greek um, heading to the psalm as well, which actually does that even for, 
when I read Malcolm's poem, he knew about it, but it's the Greek heading simply is, it's, it was added during Jewish times, it isn't done by Christians, a song of a psalm of resurrection. And that's exactly what oh. wrote. Well, that's exactly that's, where I took it. That's yeah. a wonderful link. So uh, we'll come to that in, in a moment. But um, can I start by welcoming you as, as usual to these uh, conversations and mentioning, as, as always, uh, the three books, um, David's Crown, Malcolm's uh, 150 Poems, Responding to the 150 Psalms, uh, Sue's Psalms Through the Centuries. This is just one volume, but I've actually, there are actually sort of three volumes of this, and it's an incredibly rich resource, which as you can see, I'm making much use of, and um, uh, my uh, book of praise is selections of, uh, of my illustrated translations, and perhaps I can um, just, if you happen to live in the, in the south of England, I can just put in a, a little plug for my uh, exhibition at the, uh, the Stanley Spencer Gallery, Everywhere is is Heaven, um, which is... <laughs> uh, we all in Cookham as well, so <laughs> there we are. But, um, it, but coming heaven. back... <laughs> which yeah. sort of Malcolm spoke at the, the other week. But Malcolm, just coming to that, I mean, that you obviously ended some, um, uh, with 65, with the, the Valley of the Resurrection, and, and that's where you start. Yeah. So I start with that, and of course I did Psalm 65, the day it was with a very strong sense of its liturgical context as a psalm of har as a psalm of harvest, and then transferred the, the thought of the resurrection as the, the, the things growing up in the valley standing thick with corn. But um of course, Psalm 66 also leaps out of the page at you. Um, if you're re right, certainly I'm writing within a kind of Anglican choral tradition because it is Jubilate Deo. And um, there are so many settings of jubilate, and the word jubilate is wonderful itself. You know, um, you know. So I think Augustine says somewhere that uh, in some circumstances, there's nothing you can do except jubilate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was starting in the Rich Valley of Resurrection. So it's that's because the last line of sixty-five is the opening line of sixty-six in my poetry sequence. So I'm very pleased to learn. Uh, I wish I'd known it before from Sue that in the Greek text it says it's a psalm of resurrection. Um, that that makes great sense to me. I think you know I was also responding in the in the text of this psalm to the idea that you've been through something terrible. Mm -hmm. But you've passed out of it, you know. Of course, in Christian, the allusions to the journey through the Red Sea and crossing on dry foot, the Christian typological reading of that is very much a reading about resurrection, about as well as about baptism, of course, and the kind of going down and leaving something behind and coming up. Yeah. Some. And um, and I, my first, I actually use the Latin, you know, jubilate Deo, re be joyful in God. I mean. Uh, Coverdale puts that in because he gives the Latin title simply as the opening in Latin of the Psalms. Yes. But I'm so conscious of singing a jubilate in one way or another. So that my poem starts with that. Just to, to confuse with Psalm 100, which also starts as jubilate. Yeah, exactly. And it's usually Psalm 100, oh. which is the set one. Um, but they both begin jubilate um, deo. And of course, Psalm 100 is also, you know, old hundredth, but... Um, yeah, it's yeah. there are so many things. I mean, it, of course, when I was writing these poems, you know, there are eighteen verses in this psalm, and I mean, I've only got uh, fifteen lines, so I'm always tending to go, and I'm not, I'm not translating or even paraphrasing. I'm, I'm lighting on something that um, that seems to be key to the tone of it. And yes. one of the things I light on here is the vindication of those who were made to suffer. Yes. When um, fire and water, you know, are brought out into a rich place. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? The the way that the, um, which I mean, it comes out in, in, in your reading. I mean, just in the psalm itself, that the, um, that sense of, um, a praise actually coming out from that that place of sort of pressure and actually going through through fire and water as, as that uh, that phrase and it's interesting. I mean, I you you mentioned Sue that it, that actually in some I mean for my illustration I had the the going through the Red Sea because that that's the sort of the, the central image there. But but some Christian um, illustrations actually use sort of contemporary martyrdoms, don't they, for to illustrate the psalm? Well, not contemporary. I think it was in three. 
Oh, well, yeah, I mean, contemporary, I mean, yes, contemporary to when they were writing. <laughs> exactly where martyrs were thrown into icy water in a place called Sebastian in, in now present northern Turkey, uh, thrown into water and also thrown into fire. So literally those words about the passing through water and fire in verse 12 actually happened as part of their persecution. Some Byzantine Psalters actually have in illustrations um, of these, the Theodore Psalter and the British Library is one example, where you've got the these martyrs passing through water and fire. Right, right. And I mean, the, you, I mean, you were just before we started, Malcolm, you were talking about um, uh, how the, the also this the sense of the the, the whole world um, praising <laughs> was yeah. actually a, a, a sort of central part of the of the psalm that you wanted to which yeah, I, yeah. Was, it's it's I mean it does I'm glad it's titled the resurrection because it sees rather like you get in you know Ecclesiastes and various places where what we thought was this dreadful thing and which we thought was the end was not the end. Mm something glorious came out of it and out of that glory comes the jubilant song of praise you know perhaps the praise is um is all the more resounding for the the fire and water if you like that that, that preceded it i love the uh, way it starts with come and see in verse five and then when we get to verse 16 come and hear it's a very sort of uh, auditory as well as visual psalm lots of visual images but also lots of uh, of things yeah. For the, for the... I think I think that phrase, um, you know, we we went through uh, through in verse eleven. It is in my version. Through we went through fire and water. Thou brought us to out. I think that's become also. You, you, you people say, oh, I, I'd go through fire for you, or I'd go through." I think mm. second Isaiah somewhere as well. Uh, even down to I was thinking of that that James Taylor song. You know, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. You know. Mm. But I, as a, almost a way of summoning up in the very contrast between fire and water, mm. the different vicissitudes. Obviously, from a Christian symbolic point of view, fire and water are both symbols of the Holy Spirit. Um, so there's, if you like, there's a bad drowning in water, but there's a good drowning, which is which is the mimesis of drowning in baptism. Mm. And there's a bad burning, you know, which is the symbol of hell. But there's a good burning, which is the, our God is a consuming fire, you know, the burning bush. So the very things that might be images of destruction, flood and fire, mm -hmm. are taken up and transfigured in the, the imagery, if you like, of the spirit, which is understood in one sense as water and in another sense as fire. Flames of fire at Pentecost. Yes. Well, absolutely. Hence the Eliot, you know, um, we only live, only, only suspire, you know, um, consumed by either fire or fire. Mm -hmm. Hope, yes. despair lies in the choice of pyre or pyre to be redeemed from fire by fire. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that strikes me very much about the the psalm is the way that it moves from this great vision of the world, the, the you know, shout to God, all the earth, to this incredibly sort of personal thing. You know, if my heart. Uh, if I had looked at evil in my heart, the Lord would have not attend. But he did attend to the voice of my prayer. And so it becomes incredibly sort of personal by the end of the thing. It, it just reminds me, I mean, of George Herbert's um, um, sort of version of this, when it, it, you know, that, that all the world in every corner sing. And that, but it ends, um, but above all, the heart must bear the, the, one of the largest part, <laughs> that it, it actually comes um, to that, that sort of deeply sort of personal thing at the end. Um, on which note, I think that would be a good time, Malcolm, to 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 have the the poem, if we if we might. So Psalm Psalm sixty six, Jubilate Deo. In the rich valley of the resurrection, the Jubilate Deo will resound, a jubilant rejoicing in perfection. But even here, the echo of that sound of perfect praise enriches our brief song, a canticle that's taken up around the world. The voices of the weak are strong in God's enduring praise. He knows their cause and he will vindicate the poor who long to see his justice and his good laws prevail at last. Till then, their jubilation will shake the powers that be and give them pause to tremble in the midst of exploitation and glimpse in others all the joy they've missed till love himself comes as a revelation 